Welcome to Whiteboard Friday. Yes, I am wearing the same shirt as last week, and yes, I have had a wash between now and then. <coughs> You're right. So, how do we stop land banking is what we're looking at this week. Now, for those of you who don't know, the idea of land banking is that someone buys up a whole lot of land in an area and sits on it, does nothing with it. And the idea with that is that because you own a whole bunch of land in an area, Everyone needs land to build on and that will push the prices up. So simply by doing nothing, you can get enormous you know, benefits because of the land, the price of that land has risen. Now the Productivity Commission has recently released a report which looks at the availability of land for housing and it looks at this issue of land banking too. One of the major recommendations that they have is that we should pay rates on public land. So things like schools, hospitals, all those sorts of things should pay rates to give them an incentive to free up land for housing development. It's a nice idea, but it's gonna cause all sorts of problems. We have, we'll probably see a massive money go around between national government and local government. Will it really make much difference to the amount of land that's made available? And if it does free up a whole bunch of land, do we really want to see schools like they have in London where you've got 300 kids playing on a tennis court? That's a real question that we have to face with that one. Our recommendation is that actually we should tackle the private land bankers, the people that are doing this for profit. And we could do that through a comprehensive capital income tax. Now how would that, how would that work in practice? Let's have a look. The average price of a section in Auckland is roughly half a million dollars. Now that actually comes from land banking because so many people are land banking in Auckland that keep, keeps on pushing the prices of land up. So if we say that's the average uh, section price in Auckland, what, how would a comprehensive capital income tax treat that? Well effectively this broadens our idea, our idea of what an income tax covers. It brings in all of the benefits from having wealth and counts that as income. So how do we do that in practice? Well, we say if you've got a half million dollar section that's doing nothing, it's not, you're not paying any tax on that currently, we assume that you are getting a 5% return from that, that investment in the land. Otherwise, why wouldn't you have the money in the bank? Good question. So that works out at about $25,000. We assume that person who owns that piece of land, that's the benefit that they're getting each year from having that piece of land land banked. <clears throat> and then we assume, of course, that that's the income. So we pay tax on that at 33%, the top rate, which works out at roughly $8,000. So anyone with a half million dollar section in Auckland under a comprehensive capital income tax would be paying $8,000 a year to the government in tax. That not only will stop the prices going through the roof, but it'll also actually encourage development. People won't want to sit around on the land doing nothing with it. They will want to earn money from it so that they can pay this tax. Now, if they're actually earning a productive return from that, that investment, then they'll be paying tax as normal and the comprehensive capital income tax wouldn't apply. But for things like land banking, a CCIT really would make a massive difference in terms of freeing up land for development. And that will ultimately solve the Auckland housing crisis.